Hi, I'm Elizabeth Gearhart. I'm a patent agent at Gearhart Law. Hi, my name is David Pasalski. I'm a partner and patent attorney at Gearhart Law. And I'm going to be asking David about his practice today. So David, what do you think is the thing that your clients like best about you? You know, I often say that the best thing for me is when a client says a few things. One, they say to me, wow, I can't believe you're an attorney. Like, and I, that translates to me as like, I'm someone that's approachable. And the, the, other, the other thing that they normally say sometimes is, wow, you really broke that down good. Like, I really understand it. I never really, like, no, nobody ever took the time to explain it to me. And now that you have, I really understand it. So I think that is um, something that I think um, I take pride in when, when clients say that to me, that I'm approachable and as well as kind of break it down to um, an understanding that they could appreciate. So how many clients do you think you have? So I think I probably have a little over a thousand, I imagine. Could be something like that. Maybe like 800, 900, maybe close to a thousand. Um, since joining Gerhard Law about uh, six years ago, it's been really out of control. Um, the, the firm has allowed me to grow in ways that I never even knew that I was, that, that, I, that I thought were possible. So the, the, the platform here has given me the, the opportunity to grow my client base from, for, from, for, to, to, to clients all around the world, not just the United States. David really brought our trademark practice to life. And the other thing he brought was his international expertise. So do you want to talk a little bit about what's important for trademarks and internationally as well? Yeah, I think it's really important to, for every entrepreneur, or every company that's trying to launch a project to understand that we are in a global market. I mean, it's great. The United States is still the gold standard in terms of markets, but there are clients that are that could potentially have issues in the United States, so they're in need of a U.S. patent and trademark attorney to protect their brands from another country into the United States. And we have United States clients that are looking to other markets that they could potentially have an easier um, journey through, right? And the United States is a big place and it's, it's harder to launch a product, but it might be easier in South Africa or Europe or Israel or China or Korea. Those are markets that might be a little bit smaller than the United States and have less barriers of entry. So understanding the international intellectual property laws, rules, regulations of different countries, I think is something unique that we uh, offer at the firm. And so you are an international expert, so can you tell us how you, why? How and why that happened? How and why that happened? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. I think it, it, it's funny. I'm the only uh, U.S. attorney at the American Bar Association that is a founding member of the International Associates Action Group. Everybody else is an international associate from around the world, but it was always been a passion of mine. Maybe it's my love for travel. Maybe it's my love of languages. Maybe it's my love of exotic places. I think it's all of those things. Um, but I think it's re I, I think it's almost come innately for me to 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 want to learn about uh, a different intellectual property regime. So I spend a lot of time in a lot of different countries. I participate in intellectual property conferences around the world, all in different lo all in different locations. I'm trying my best to also be involved in the international patent and trademark harmonization of laws around the world so that it's easier for a U.S. company to do business in a foreign country or a foreign uh, applicant to do business in the United States. So if all of our laws were on par, if we all harmonized, then uh, it would be easier to you know, protect your patent or your trademark in another country. So there are organizations that work hard uh, to, 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 to harmonize, and it's made up of intellectual property professionals. And so um, I usually represent the United States in these types of meetings um, with other intellectual properties, with other U.S. intellectual property attorneys. Uh, to harmonize things like, you know, what what should be the standard for getting a trademark in a country? Should it be the same as the United States as it is in Europe? Um, what are the technical requirements for a software patent? Should it be different in Europe as it is in the United States, or should it all be on one level? So different things like that, I think, are really important. 
And you forgot to mention that you are invited to give presentations <laughs> around the world. Yeah. I like to speak. I like to present. How many different <laughs> countries have you been in in 2019, do you think? Um, in 2019, I probably have been in maybe seven countries um, and probably like seven states in the United States as well. I really, really enjoy that. I'm a big, I'm, I'm all about education and empowerment. I love a, a company or a person that actually becomes my client to be one that's well informed. So I'll spend hours if I have to educating and empowering entrepreneurs, investors, small companies, emerging company, whatever, as long because because by the time they become the client, I want them to already not be surprised by what's going to happen. That they're that because that's good customer service as well. So I want them to 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 know and appreciate the risks, the rewards, the financial obligations, the costs, the benefits, the the cons of of of, of dealing in this global market. So yeah, education and empowerment is um, is a big thing, and so yeah, I do I do these things on 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 panels, and 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 it's and it's always fun to to do that, and you get to see a little bit of the country as well that you're visiting. And if it wasn't for intellectual property, I don't think I would have gone to Australia or Taiwan or something like that. Yeah, so I, it's good to mix a little business and pleasure sometimes. So I'm going to ask you a hypothetical as a client. Yeah. So something somebody might want to ask you. So. Let's say I started this clothing line, Super Silly Costumes. Super Silly Costumes. And I did actually get a trademark in the U.S. on the name. And, but I have different designs that I have designed myself. Nobody else has them. I haven't done anything with that. But I'm getting requests for this from all over the world. Because, of course, I have it online on my website. So what should I do? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, and usually the question usually comes up when you're really being successful. It's probably something that you should have anticipated before uh, and, 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 and planned for. So I think we, we live in a territorial intellectual property system. Your protection is only in the country that you file in. So if you have a United States trademark or United States patent, you, that's your protection because we're territorial. If you are now shipping to another country or you are selling your product in a country, we'll just take, we'll take Europe as an example, then under these rules, under these territorial rules, you really don't have protection in Europe because you don't have the corresponding patent or trademark or design in that country. So the first thing you need to do is file in that country. However, there are treaties in the world that say there's only a certain limited time that you can actually file in a country with your patent and trademark. So we're not going to talk about patents now, but we'll talk about design and trademark. So under certain treaties, one of the, in, in trademark it's called the Madrid Protocol, it says that in order for you to file in another country, you have to do so. You have to file your trademark. If you want to file your trademark from the United States into, into Europe, you have to do so within six months of your United States trademark. So does that mean when you apply for it or when it gets granted From, to you? So, so, that, so, so thank God there's that. So usually the law says within six months of your filing date. So in your situation, it sounds like you, you're, in your hypothetical, you have already have a granted U.S. trademark. Yes. And thank God you do because if you miss that six-month date, doesn't mean you can't file in Europe you just probably, you will only be able to file in Europe now that you have the registration. So there, oh, uh, that, that same treaty says, well, if you have a registration in another country, you can confirm that registration by filing in Europe. I mean, so you can do that. You can end up getting a European trademark registration off of your U.S. trademark registration if you fail to have filed within the first six months. But there's a reason why you want to file within the first six months is because if you filed within the first six months, then your filing date, which is it's all about the filing date, right? That's the day that you, the, the, the country will recognize that your existence. So if you do within the first six months of your U.S. filing date, then your filing date in Europe is your filing date in the United States. So in your hypothetical, if we are fast forwarding to when you have the registration, three years would have passed maybe, or two years, or a year would have passed. That means when you file in Europe, a whole year has passed, which means potentially there could have been somebody with a, a similar trademark and your, your, yours is super silly costumes. There could be a magnificent silly costumes or there could be 
uh, super silly clothing or something. There could be super billy clothing or something. And that those trademarks could have already existed in Europe. And so when you go to confirm your registration, somebody could have uh, filed before you. But those aren't my trademark. They're not your trademark, but the, the, in trademarks, the standard is the likelihood of confusion. So it's funny, usually when a, when a, when a, when a client comes into the, to the, to the firm or a potential client, they'll say, oh, I already did a trademark search. I know there, my, my, there is not another super silly costume. And how do you know that? Well, I went to the European Trademark Office website, or I went to the US Trademark website, and I searched super silly costumes, and nobody else existed, and so um, I can get it. But that's not the standard. The standard is the likelihood of confusion. So it could mean that, uh, that a, a, a trademark, doesn't have to be exact, doesn't have to be conflict with you exactly, it could be a confusingly similar trademark. That means a trademark that, that maybe rhymes with it or spelled differently or has one word different or one letter different. And so a, a mark like magnificent silly costumes could really, re under the eyes of trademark law, could be deemed confusingly similar to yours, right? They're gonna sit on the same shelves, you're probably going to sell in the same way. Like these are all factors that the trademark offices look like. It's that they look that they look at. It's not just whether there's exactly the same words. It's whether there are confusingly similar words. So what if mine was super silly costumes for adults, and there were magnificent silly costumes for dogs or for action figures or something? Would that still be? So there are. It, it could potentially be a problem. It's a better. It's a. It's a better example of, um, of of reasons that they're not similar, right? So the more reasons you have of not similarity, other than the words, right? I'm I'm selling to dogs, so a person that's looking for a dog costume is probably not the same person that's going to look for an adult costume for himself. That may or may not be true. Unless they want to dress alike. Unless they want to dress like <laughs> exactly. Which can happen. Exactly. So and maybe that's a new business. No, but but, but that but that's why. So 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 could you, it could potentially be a new business. But could you imagine if the tra the trademark office is probably thinking that the same thing? Well, there is a chance that the dog may want that the adult may want to buy a costume for his dog that matches his. But that but that works against you, right? Because that means that there's going to be confusion in the marketplace. By the way, there's we. I, I must say to you, like for even for the for 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 the benefit of the audience, <laughs> that super silly costumes is a terrible example of a trademark. <laughs> terrible. Why? Let, I'll tell, tell you. Tell me why, so, David. So, so trademarks have to be distinct. They have to be distinctive, and so there's a few rules about this. And one of them is a trademark should not contain generic words, and they shouldn't contain descriptive words because if something's descriptive. By, by law, it's not distinct. It doesn't stand that, out. What does that mean, descriptive? So if you are selling, if you have to describe what you're selling by using your trademark, it's descriptive. So I ask you, you are the owner of super silly costumes. What do you sell? Costumes. <laughs> but immediately, costumes, costumes, right? Costumes <laughs> yeah. is going to be descriptive. So they won't allow that as a trademark? They, exactly. They will maybe give you super silly, right? Because you're not selling supers, you're not selling sillies, you're selling costumes. So the part of your trademark will be disclaimed. It's almost like put an X through the word costumes. Why costumes is descriptive and costumes is generic. It belongs to everyone. The trademark office is not going to give you the exclusive right, the only, that's what trademark is, right? Trademarks and patents are exclusion, exclusionary rights in, 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 in intellectual property. So it's the right to say, you can't use this. You can't come into my property. They're not gonna say, Elizabeth Gerhardt, you now own the word costume. You can control whatever happens to it. Yeah, that's generic. They're never gonna do that. They may give you the word super, they may give you the word silly, but even then I think you understand that there's limits to that. People use super, people use silly. You know, it's you might have to fight for those words. So I think the best kind of the best kind of examples of trademarks are what we call like arbitrary or fanciful words like apple. Apple doesn't sell apples, right? Apple might be a generic word, but they're not using it in a descriptive way because they're not selling apples, they're selling you know, iPods and, and, and phones and stuff like that. But the best is to come up with a totally new word, like Kodak, right? Or, or like, or Google or Uber. Like these are words that, are, that don't describe what, what they're selling. 
And so I often say to, to, to clients, come up with the most ridiculous sounding word. Merge two words together. The more like the, 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 the more ridiculous it sounds, probably the better, right? Because no, the chances are low that nobody else has it. And that's good for other reasons too. I mean, here everybody's going to be fighting for the same internet SEO domain names. And there's probably already hundreds of people that have super silly, like domain names with super, domain names with silly, domain names with costumes. But very few probably have Uber, right? Very few probably have Kodak, right? Because those were words that they've kind of plucked out of obscurity and created a whole brand around it. So I think it's important. If you know those rules of how to create a brand, how to create a trademark, it will only increase your protection. And then that protection can like travel with you from the United States where you were and then potentially international to another country because the odds are that the other country probably hasn't heard of that word that you made up or that name that you're you know, using in a non-descriptive, non-generic way. So that's important. So let me just clarify for yeah. a little bit. So let's say Xerox, okay. Xerox. So Xerox gets their trademark in the U.S., but they file in Europe at the same time. You can do that. And the trademark hasn't been registered yet. And somebody in Europe a day later files Xerox in Europe. Who gets the trademark? So we are considered like the majority of jurisdictions, the majority of countries in this world are first to file. So the fact that you have beat someone by one day in Europe is enough for you to oppose or try to stop the use of this other company that filed two days after you. I've been involved in situations like that, where if you look it, it, that, that uh, I have a client that has created a, uh, uh, that, that has filed for a trademark, and within three or four days, it's almost bizarre how it happens. Somebody else has filed after them, maybe selling something different, but the, the dates are so close to each other, Make no mistake about it, first to file. If that's why it's so important that you try to file for a trademark right away. In the United States, we have something called common law protection where you don't have to file for a trademark registration until you're ready or until you want to or until you have interstate commerce. But this is the danger. If you wait 20 years, somebody could, somebody with, somebody with a business that, has, that, that is only two years old could have filed first, and then when you decide to take your 20-year-old trademark that has common law protection and file for a federal trademark, this you know small little company or big little company that's only been around for two years, you've been around for 18 more years, has beat you to it, right? They have filed first. So um, it's, uh, it's definitely, a, it's definitely a, it's a, it's a business decision a company has to make whether they file immediately or they wait to file. I have one more question then, logos. So do logos just go through automatically? I mean, they're all pretty different from each other. Do you have trouble getting those through? So uh, you'd be surprised, actually. You'd be surprised how many logos are similar to each other. And so when we do, when you do a trademark search, you don't just do, we do, we do trademark searches on logos as well because, you know, there might be, you know, 50 ways to characterize a fox, right? I have a client that wanted to use a fox. And um, he came to us with the fox, and we did a logo of all the foxes that the trademark office has, because you can search. Like every single artistic design at the trademark office gets a six-digit code, a design code. And so it's very easy for the trademark office to search logos and use the same standard of confusingly similar, right? If two foxes, there might be, you know, a hundred ways to draw a fox, but out of those hundred, two or three might be kind of similar. Right, one might be more realistic, one might be more cartoonish, one might be a bust of a head, one might be the full body. So they're looking at all of those things. There's like a very famous case about um, logos at the trademark uh, uh, um, office. They were like, the, 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 the logo of one company was three birds flying to the right. So now this company comes along and has three birds flying to the left. And so the trademark office is like, no, to, those are way too similar, right? They're a, a reasonable, ordinary, prudent consumer, which is the standard, will get these confused. They will think that the company that has birds flying to the right is probably now just going in a different direction with birds flying to the left with another product, <laughs> right? So, I mean, it, 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 sounds, it almost sounds ridiculous, but it's true. Like, that's why, you know, like when, when, like when you hire a logo designer, 
You have to trust who you hire because they're probably looking at other brands. They're being inspired by other brands. They're creating a unique logo for you that they believe is unique. And then you go, and then we go to file it and we realize, oh my God, there's like five or six other logos that look the exact same way. So is it the fault of the designer that you hired? You know, it, you know the, the, the line between inspiration and infringement of a logo is really thin. So the answer to your question is logos can get through. Logos add distinction to words that you want. Like in your super silly costumes, if you had a logo of a cat, then you likely will get protection on the cat. Maybe not the word costumes, maybe not the word super, but at least you'll get protection on your cat. But make no mistake about it, your cat still can't look like another cat logo that's already on the, that's already on the trademark register. So logos have to be distinct as well. I definitely think they're easier to get through if you do if you work with the right people. Yeah. So if if I have a US trademark, let's say I filed it and it's not the six month period yet, how many countries can I file it in? So unfortunately, there is no like international trademark application. We get that a lot in patents too. Like where everyone's like, we're like, there's like, is there like a worldwide patent? Is there a worldwide trademark? Is there one filing that covers like 200 countries? No. It doesn't work like that. I mean, every <laughs> single country has to be filed in. But I think it's a strategic decision. Uh, I, there's very few companies in the world, even the largest ones, that file their trademarks in all 200 something countries. They file in countries where they know they're going to have a market, where they know they're going to ship their products, where they know there might be infringement, where they know that they're potentially manufacturing their product or producing their product, right? Because that's where the potential for infringement may occur might kind of leak out or something like that. So I think the average, I think for me, from our firm's perspective, I think the average amount of countries where a small to large company files in, or even an entrepreneur, is probably around four to 10 countries. Europe's a big one, China's a big one, Korea's a big one. Uh, but uh, yeah, you'd have to file in every single individual country where you would want protection of that trademark. So how much does it cost? It depends. Uh, our fees are always flat. Our fees are 600 to $650, depending on the country, it's flat. But the official fees range in prices. Something like Europe, which includes you know, 20 or 38 member states, maybe I might, might have gotten that number wrong, but around, you get more states, you get more bang for your buck, have, probably have a filing fee of around $2,500, $3,000. A country like Canada is about $1,200. A country like Mexico is like $800. So it, almost like it, the, the cost is almost commiserate with the maturity of the jurisdiction. So the more obscure the country, the more expensive it's going to be. Like the Middle East countries, like uh, like Jordan and the and the United Arab Emirates, um, Iran, all these different like they have very unsophisticated intellectual property laws, which means you're kind of paying a premium to get in there. But the more sophisticated the country is, like Korea, Japan, Canada, Mexico, you're probably looking at around you know, $800 to let's say $3,000 to per country. Plus 600. Plus per. our fee of 600 or $650. Yes. Right, so how much does it cost to get a U.S. trademark typically? A U.S. trademark, if you're already using your mark, it will take about a year to get. We've gotten them in like seven months, but but really the, the, the average is a year and will probably cost you with our fees and official fees around 2,500, maybe 2,000, 2,500. If all goes well, it can cost as low as, you know, 1,800. Um, but it really depends on the search and what they're going to find, which is why we do the search to anticipate what the potential for the future costs might be. So um, I, I always say to people, if you're going to spend at least 2,500 in the United States, figure you'll probably spend at least that much in another country. Like this, if you want to budget yourself, you want to file in 10 countries, you know, figure you're probably going to spend about $20,000, right? If you want to say it's like 2,000, 2,500 per country. Um, so yeah, it's a big decision. Um, uh, trademarks is, uh, I think, w w w whether you're going to have a patent or not, you're always going to have a brand, right? I mean, at right. the end of the day, it's, it's, a really, it's a really important part of the journey. Not everyone qualifies for a patent. Not everybody can get a patent. Not everybody can afford a patent. And if that's the case, you best be looking into trademarks because that will be your only form of intellectual property. Right. So if you don't have any other way to protect what you have, your brand is everything. Everything. So you have to really have a strong brand. Agreed. Yeah. So 
What comes first, the trademark or the branding agency that helps you decide what your name's going to be? Yeah, that's a <laughs> it's real... It's kind of a circle, right? It is, like... it is. I have definitely been involved in situations with large clients that have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to name a grape, right? To name a new grape for a wine. Clearly, people don't have that kind of money. And so, you know, creating a brand and creating a trademark and a logo is something you can do yourself. Um, you probably will need a brand, brand agency later to maybe enforce your trademark and police it and enforce it and make sure that your you know, marketing is in line with your company uh, mission and stuff like that. But the initial concept of your trademark, of your logo, of your colors, I think it should be, should be, should be done by, by the founders or the entrepreneurs or the inventors or the people that are working on the, the people that are most closest to the project. I don't think you have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars now to create a trademark that is worth protecting. I think that's something you can do on your own. I, I really believe that. So, but the, you really do have to do a search before you launch yeah, or do anything, right? Yeah, it's it's a shame. Like it's it sucks to really deliver bad news to a client that comes in and say says I now want to file for my trademark. I have all this product. I branded it on my website. I got my swag. I got my shirts. I'm ready. And then we do the search. It's really hard news to break to a client to say, oh my God, like there's. This is a really risky trademark. Somebody has something similar or even the same as you. And this, if, if you, we may not even get this. You may not, may, may not even have the protection that you thought you were going to get for And now you've just went and spent like, you know, tens of thousands of dollars on marketing. Like, that's not good. Can they buy the trademark from the other person? Will they? Well, it depends on that. If that, if that company's doing really well, then, then maybe, but... I, I, the, the, there's another scenario where maybe they could ask that company for consent to use the trademark alongside of them. Like they can both coexist. That may happen. I've definitely been involved in situations like that where my client must, that's, that's the only, if they really want it, they must approach this other company and say, do you agree to coexist with us? You, you you stay on your side of the world. We'll stay on our side of the world. You say you you sell your products. We'll sell our products. And if there's any confusion in the marketplace, we'll deal with it then. We call those uh, we call those types of agreements coexistence agreements, and they're really an integral part of trademark uh, examination and prosecution and enforcement. But that costs money, right? If it would be it would be a search could maybe uncover those risks, and then you can make an informed decision as to whether in your journey you're going to need something like that. But to have to deal with that when you didn't know about it, that's not a good situation. Like better to know about these things beforehand. Do the search. It's a few hundred dollars. It's almost negligible not to do it. And the same with the patent. It's almost negligible not to do intellectual property searches before you actually try to protect something. It's, it, it, it can really set the stage for what type of risk and what type of cost you're going to be facing over the next few years. You know? Very good. So to summarize, you can get intellectual property protection around the world, but it's tricky, it's expensive, and you better have somebody who knows what they're doing. Agreed. And you, you have to be careful with trademarks. They're not as straightforward and easy as people think. Uh, that's an excellent point. It's, uh, I, I think it's one of the types of intellectual property where people think they can do it on their own. Yes. And I, I, I totally understand the desire and the actual strategy of doing it on your own. Money reasons, I, I want to spend my money somewhere else. But for all the reasons that you just mentioned, from my experience, it often, usually the, the hole that you may have to dig yourself out of because you didn't appreciate the risks and intricacies of trademark law will, 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 it's going to it's going to be hard it's going to be expensive to dig yourself out of that and so you'll end up spending double usually i i find you end up spending double or you may not or, or i've been involved in situations where people have filed their own trademark and then they come to us and there's nothing we can do for them we can't mm. get over the rejection and it's too confusing there's something mm. out there you should have known this and you and you and, and mm. it was a waste of time and money so they scrap all their marketing and start over Scrap all their marketing and start over. Oh my gosh. So, as I said at the beginning, 
if you're not an attorney, you can't do trademarks for anybody else, right? Right, correct, correct. So if somebody says, hey, I can do your trademark for you, ask to see their law degree, <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, it's, the, it, 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 it's a really good point because the people that work for the trademark office in, in, in the United States are attorneys. They are trademark attorneys. So you, you should have your own representation to deal with the trademark attorney that's representing the United States, you know, it's like representing yourself in like a murder trial, right? Like you probably don't want to do that, right? You probably should get like no, definitely you probably not. should get like defense counsel, but I don't right? Want to kill anybody <laughs> right? either. Well, no, I take that back. <laughs> no, but like I've had a friend that's like, oh, I represented myself in a divorce. Uh, you have no custody now. You're like paying alimony. Like you probably should have gotten a lawyer. You have a you know? fool for a client. <laughs> exactly. So, so it, you need to get legal advice if you're thinking of doing any of this. This has been our opinion on it, but yes. you need to get your own legal advice and... Be educated on it, be empowered by it, and then make the decision whether you want to do it yourself. It's definitely intricate and it, there's a lot of steps and it should not be forsaken or it should not be taken for granted as to how intricate it could be. It could be the difference between the, the strength of your brand and logo in, in, in years to come. Thank you, David. So this is David Postalski, partner patent and intellectual property attorney at Gearhart Law. I'm Elizabeth Gearhart, patent agent at Gearhart Law. And if you have any questions at all, please call us at Gearhart Law, email us, fill out a contact form on the website. We are more than happy to help you. Thank you.